Now one of the things that happen, the, what we have to remember is that the Qur'an is a book. And books by their nature are words. And words are problematic. Because words have many meanings. I mean, there's people here that have heard things that I've said now that maybe I didn't even intend. But this is the human nature. We filter words through our frames of reference. There's something in cognitive psychology called assimilation and accommodation theory, which is that what we tend to do is when we hear something, we tend to uh, first assimilate it, and then we find in our frame of reference how we can accommodate it. And the Western people are brilliant at this. They're brilliant at giving words for everything. Like they'll say, for instance, uh, hearing my talk today, they'll say, huh, um, this is a devotional talk, as opposed to an objective talk. You see, I'm not being objective because I'm being devotional, right? And it's nice words. They're brilliant. I mean, if you want to just memorize words, uh, go to university, because that's what they give you, words for everything. They're just names that you name. That's all they do, they name. You see, because the gods of today are no longer Lat and Uzza and Manat and Wood and all the... No, they're concepts, evolution, you see, liberty, justice, the American way, these type of things. The Marines, Semper, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Semper Fidelis. I mean, this is interesting. That's the Marine slogan. Semper Fidelis. And fidelity is Iman. That's faith. What are you always faithful to? Blind obedience. This is what they teach them. If a Marine, if they say uh, to run up that hill, even though he's going to get killed, he's been brainwashed to where he'll do it. So, uh, see, they say, oh, this crazy human being, who would strap himself full of bombs and go blow up, you know, a Marine base? Well, the Marines themselves do the same thing. <laughs> Only they don't do it for, you know, trying to liberate their land. They usually do it trying to conquer another people. And what are you doing in Lebanon? Where are you from, Kentucky? <laughs> well, what are you doing in Lebanon? Oh, well, I'm defending, uh, uh, well, I basically got sent here. <laughs> I mean, that's really what you're dealing with. I mean, so who's rational and who's irrational? This is the question. Don't be fooled. We need anthropology too. We need to study these beasties just like they study us. You see? Let's get into their psychology. Let's see how they think. Why is it they don't have number 13 in their elevators? I mean, did you ever think of that? <laughs> Those irrational Muslims. <laughs> you, I've been in Saudi Arabia. There's number 13. We don't have a problem with 13. What's your problem? Uh, well, uh, well, uh, let me think about that, <laughs> you know. Uh, devil's number. Devil's number? Well, Jesus was one and he had 12 disciples. One plus 12, that equals 13. Was he a, a devil? <laughs> I mean, seriously. See, we fall into these traps of believing all this false dialectic. Now, why? Because we don't have uh, intellectual tradition anymore. We've become people that really tend not to think like everybody else, which is unfortunate and has its own interpretations. But I wanted to, I got off on a, uh, now where was I before that when I brought up the, do you remember? <laughs> you're supposed to, that's what the chairman's for. You're, you're supposed to be following, then you give a summary and... No, oral thing, that was the beginning. I've gone to He's thinking he's only got 15 minutes left. <laughs> where was who? Where was I? Because I went into something and I didn't want to. Oh, all right, yeah, kalam theology projection. I think that's where we were. Projection, projecting upon that that. Um, Oh, words. This is where I wanted to go. Words and the meanings of words. The Qur'an itself. Because the Qur'an is words, it has to be understood. Now, understanding the Qur'an means understanding Arabic language. We have placed this into the Arabic language. The uncreated word of Allah is placed into the Arabic language. Why? In order that you know by necessity, because it will necess necessitate your thinking. Now, one of the things about the Arabic language is that it's elliptical by nature. It's what in English they call ellipsis, the three dots, dot, dot, dot. In other words, they don't tell you the whole sentence. That's called an ellipsis. Well, in the Quran, there's a lot of ellipsis. Why is that? Because ellipsis demands that you think. It forces you to think. 
When everything is spelled out for you, that does not force you to think. So by the nature, Allah does not want us to be passive reciters of the Qur'an. He wants us to be active studiers of the Qur'an. He wants, us, he wants to force us to think. And so what this necessitated was a need for the grammar. And this is why grammar is really one of the penultimate sciences of Islam. And I say penultimate because it's not the final purpose. Grammar is not a purpose. Uh, it is a means. The ultimate science is tafsir, you see, which is to understand the Book of Allah. This is the highest science by consensus of the ulama, to understand the Book of Allah. But despite that fact, many, many ulama were not mufassirin. So of some of the greatest ulama, Imam Nawawi is one of the greatest of our scholars. I mean, of all the ulama, أَغْبِطُهُ أَكْثَرْ مِنْ أَيْ I envy him in a good way more than any other alim. Why? Because Imam Nawawi was given a tawfiq that I don't see in any other alim of the later period because his books are accepted by everybody. You know, after the book of Allah, Riyadh al-Salihin, Arba'in al-Nawawiyya, the, uh, the uh, uh, extraordinary al-Majmu'ah, which in the Shafi'i Madhab, after Imam uh, uh, al-Nawawi showed up, the Shafi'is just shut up and started quoting Imam Nawawi. And he died before he was 40 years of age. Just phenomenal human being. I mean, this is part of our intellectual legacy. Now, the thing that the fact is he never wrote tafsir. He commented on hadith, and his main uh, emphasis was fiqh and hadith, and naturally usul because it's necessary. Why is that? Because there was a need. And this is what our ulama have always done. They have risen to the occasion. Whatever the need was, they fulfill it. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-alim idha mata alimun futihat thughratun. When the alim dies, an opening emerges. An intellectual opening. In other words, our border now has a space. La yasudduha illa alimun akhar. It will not be filled or protected except by another alim. So when the ulama saw, for instance, that the muhaddithin were dying off, then that became their emphasis.